Welcome along to today's talk. My name is Nicola and I'm one of the archivists here at the MNS Company Archive. We collect, share and celebrate MNS's unique heritage dating back to 1884 when our founder Michael Marks set up his first market stall in Leeds. This is a pre-recorded talk, but I'm here today to respond to comments and questions during the talk. And of course, you're welcome to contact us with questions at any time. Our talks often focus on sharing content from the archive, but this one will be a bit different as we're focusing on how we display the archive collection within our exhibition spaces. Today, I'm going to give you a sneak peek of how we set up and maintain our exhibitions. The idea for this talk emerged because we quite often get asked by other archives and museums about the design process behind our exhibition space, but we hope that this talk will also be of interest to anybody who loves visiting exhibitions and might enjoy hearing about how we put it all together. The archive opened in Leeds in 2012 in our dedicated building and we're based on the University of Leeds Western Campus on Clarendon Road in Leeds. Before that, we hosted a small exhibition in the University of Leeds Parkinson Building between 2009 and 2011, while our building was being constructed and while we were planning the move of the archive collection from London to Leeds. Nowadays, our permanent exhibition is our main public space and it's usually open for anyone to pop in and explore, as well as for booked visits. We also have a rolling schedule of temporary exhibitions. It's quite unusual to have the opportunity to create an entire exhibition area from scratch. As our whole archive building was designed as the permanent home of the archive collection, everything was centred around the collection and with visitors in mind. It's also relatively unusual for archives, as opposed to museums, to have an exhibition area of this scale. Users of most archives access collections by requesting specific material from the archive to view in a reading room. Of course, we do offer a reading room service as well, but we wanted to make sure that anybody with a passion for MS or an interest in British social history could come and browse and see highlights from the collection without necessarily having to identify specific archive items to consult in the reading room. The exhibition concept and layout was planned with the intention that it would provide a permanent, unchanging framework within which different parts of the archive collection could be showcased on a regular rotation. This approach was taken because after the initial collaboration with specialist museum designers, the exhibition would be maintained in the long term by the MS archive team, a small team with a wide range of duties and experienced in archives and museums, but not necessarily in exhibition design. These images show the detailed designs as created by the exhibition design team. The permanent exhibition framework enables the archive team to keep the exhibition looking engaging and attractive without needing too much time, too much additional expenditure on new display equipment or extensive design expertise. Some thought was given to arranging the exhibition in line with MS's corporate messaging. That's the key words and slogans that businesses use to express our core values. But although MS's fundamental principles, including a long standing commitment to quality and value, have remained the same from our first penny bazaar to the present, the way that these are articulated will change over time and could risk the exhibition design being outdated quite quickly. Instead, we opted for a more traditional chronological approach, with each exhibition case focusing on a decade or two. This first case focuses on the period up to 1920, where penny bazaars selling haberdashery items were the core of our business, and we had a set price point of one penny. It also includes a photograph of a typical penny bazaar shop as the backdrop to the case. The chronological approach also provides more opportunities for displaying particularly strong or interesting areas of the collection like this case, which focuses on the expansion of products sold at m and in the 1920s and 30s, including the first clothing sold at m and in the 1920s and the introduction of food departments to all of our stores in 1931 onwards. Each of these chronological cases in the exhibition displays key themes at m and covering a decade or two. The displays show how our customers would have seen us at the time, 
with each case like looking through a store window of the period. The 1940s case includes highlights from our collection of wartime utility clothing. Clothing was rationed during World War II and utility clothing was designed to give people a guarantee that the garments they were buying were good quality and would last. From the beginning we took a relatively low-tech approach. We don't have an IT technician on site in the event of a fancy bit of digital equipment developing a fault, so we opted for an exhibition design that uses IT very sparingly. A customer's visit will still be engaging and enjoyable even if one of the audio-visual features isn't working properly. There's an example of this in the 1950s case, which includes a TV screen which shows extracts from m and adverts which were shown in cinemas to show off the new man-made, easy-care, easy-wear fabrics that were now available. We invested in fairly generic display cases that would be easy for staff to work with and in during exhibition changeovers. The line in the middle of the front panel is where the case doors swing open to allow us access. We can also swap over titles, captions and backdrops fairly quickly. The cases are indeed easy to work with, as I can attest, and we've often been able to open the exhibition case doors and switch over an entire set of objects within minutes before opening the doors to the public in the morning. The 1960s case often has examples of the new teen ranges of mini skirts and shift dresses that were available at m and as well as examples of the bright and bold food packaging that we were developing. In the spaces between the main cases, we have individual plinths where we can show off particular items like this chicken. The chicken represents a key m and innovation developed in 1960. We were the first major retailer to be able to sell fresh chilled chicken and we did this by developing the cold chain process. In similar spaces around the exhibition are kids books and recipe books from our handling collection for visitors to be able to get hands on with. You might have noticed that there's a lot of women's wear in these exhibition cases. Fashion collections often have a female focus partly because of the way that different garments have been retained or otherwise by their owners. We're always working to develop the weaker areas of our collection, like menswear and kidswear, which will help us to further enhance our displays. This exhibition case covers the 1970s and 1980s and includes newly introduced convenience foods like Chicken Kiev, as well as Dallas-inspired shoulder pads often featuring here. The exhibition moves through the 1990s into the 2000s, featuring the launch of sub-brands like Peruna and Autograph and the introduction of Fairtrade Cotton at m and We even bring things right up to date with this exhibition case looking at the year 2010 onwards. This case focuses on recent innovations, bestsellers and iconic items. It always includes examples of one or two of our recent products. Here we can see our Plant Kitchen Vegan range, which was launched last year, and the m and waistcoat, famously worn by Gareth Southgate during the 2018 World Cup. The exhibition has to serve multiple purposes, from drop-in visitors, guided tours for coach groups, and internal m and visitors. If we have a group visit from older people with mobility issues, there's space for us to put out plenty of seating to allow people to take a quick rest. We also have a huge range of internal visitors from store interns and work experience students to new board members. And the space has been flexible enough to host vintage fashion shows with m and garments from our handling collection and even the occasional celebrity visit. Here's Twiggy at a special event in 2017. I'm pleased that we've got enough time to give you a sneak peek of what our fashion shows look like. All the clothes worn by models are from our handling collection. This is mostly made up of garments that duplicate items held within the main collection, with a few replicas of rare 1930s garments. We're very strict with garments from the core archive collection, which we wouldn't allow anyone to wear, of course. Good morning and welcome to our show here, Dressed in Time.
In a separate part of our exhibition is the behind the scenes area. This section follows the same chronological pattern as the main exhibition, but allows us to put the spotlight on some of the key documents from the collection that might get lost in a large exhibition case. In the behind the scenes section, we can really focus in on specific stories like the incredible detail of our 1960s staff training records, or our 1950s cake recipes that paved the way for shop-bought cake being acceptable to serve to guests who came round for tea. It also allows us to show off some of our favourite photographs, examples of staff uniforms from over the years and hands-on exhibits like our replica Penny Bazaar till. We've had replicas made from a selection of garments and objects so that we can provide a kids dressing up area and a handling collection of clothing that can be used with visitors in a much more hands-on way than we could allow with the original archived garments. This section is also brought right up to date with examples from current staff magazines and our new Ocado partnership. But what about the rest of the collection that isn't on display in the exhibition? Only a tiny portion of the collection is on display at any one time. The rest of it is stored in our strong room in ideal storage conditions of around 16 degrees Celsius and 40% relative humidity. These conditions create a dry, cool environment, perfect for making sure that paper, textiles and photographs are maintained in good condition. Most of the collection is stored in boxes with acid-free packaging materials. We use garment bags made of a special breathable material for dresses and coats and large flat boxes for garments like knitwear that benefit from being stored flat. We even have a special cold room held at 2 degrees Celsius for our film reels and negatives. These areas aren't open to the public. We issue items from here to view in our reading room or to display in the exhibition. Each time we remove something from its box or bag, we replace it with a garment slip so we always know where everything is. We update the exhibition several times a year. The light levels and temperature in the exhibition space are also carefully monitored, but regularly rotating the material on display means that the items on display in the exhibition aren't out of their ideal storage conditions for too long and that repeat visitors get to see something different. For example, the 1950s case will always have a new look style dress made from a synthetic fabric, reflecting the significant shift in fashion and the revolution in man-made wonder fabrics seen in the 1950s. The Penny Bazaar case will always have a selection of buttons, which were a key M&S product in the era before we sold ready-made clothing. And the 1970s case will almost always have a brilliant example of a floral panty girdle, which was the latest innovation in shapewear. Other items within the case will vary more between each exhibition refresh. For instance, we only have one example of these amazing 1960s boots. As you can see, we look after a diverse range of M&S objects, and not everything is suitable to be included in the exhibition, unfortunately. Some things might be too delicate to display, like some of our early 1930s garments. Other items, like a St Michael 1950s suitcase, might actually be too large. And then we also have a few items which are too small. We have a wide selection of museum mannequins to cater for vintage sizing, but we still have one or two 1940s and 1950s dresses which just won't fit on our mannequins because of their tiny waist size. We have lots of iconic items that we love to include in our exhibition, but things can't be on display too often for conservation reasons. We also make sure that newly accessioned and never before seen garments are prioritised in the exhibition. All of this means that our exhibition changeovers have to be carefully planned so we know that everything will fit. There are at least 150 items in our permanent exhibition at any one time, so updating them all is a big job. Although we sometimes change over the exhibition during our short annual closure for essential behind the scenes work, at other times we switch over the whole exhibition using the short blocks of time each morning before we open to the public. 
Planning these changeovers starts several weeks ahead using an enormous Excel spreadsheet and the occasional trial run. This exclusive behind the scenes image shows our normally tidy strong room table in full exhibition changeover mode. We use a variety of different mannequins for garments and perspex mounts for displaying smaller items. We even have a special head shaped form for hats. Sometimes we have to get more creative depending on the object, using acid free archive tissue paper to stuff boots or to fill out a particularly generous bra. As well as our permanent exhibition, we have a small temporary exhibition space which we can use in a really flexible way. We tend to have two or three different exhibitions in this space each year. It's an area that we can use to highlight key MS anniversaries, themes we want to explore in more detail, and it's where we can showcase recent archive projects. But in the last few years, we've also opened up the space for projects with external partners where co-creation has been the name of the game, and we've worked with students, academics and community projects. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking you through some of our favourite temporary exhibitions from the last few years. In 2018, we completed a piece of research into the provenance of items in the archive collection, which led to this exhibition, all about celebrating stories in the archive. The items that are donated to the archive often come with stories about how they have been used and worn by their previous owner. These stories bring the objects to life and give us an insight into the role that they have performed in their owner's life, playing a part in childhoods, weddings, careers, holidays and retirements. On the far right of this image from the exhibition is a storm lantern which was used in the basement air raid shelter at Cardiff store during World War II. The donor of the lantern, Vera, was part of the store's air raid precautions team. She was responsible for checking the emergency provisions in the shelter, like water and even tinned sardines. The emergency escape hatch for the basement shelter opened out onto the pavement and had to be checked daily. Passers-by were often surprised to see Vera's head and shoulders appearing from the depths of the store. Vera's duties continued until her call-up to join the war services. After the war, she returned to work at m &S, later donating the storm lantern to the archive. Next we've got this child's petticoat from 1958, which belonged to the daughter of Marjorie, who was a supervisor at our Cheltenham store and retired in 1971. If you look closely at the petticoat, some alterations have been made to the back where it fastens to make it smaller. In this image, we can see a girl's stripy dress and this was bought by a customer called Anna around 1960, along with another similar dress in striped pink and green. The dresses were worn by all five of Anna's granddaughters, with the hems repeatedly let up and down as the children grew and the dresses were passed on to the next grandchild. And when you look really closely at the hem, you can see the little pinholes from where the hem's gone up and down over the years. At the beginning of 2019, our Prints and Patterns exhibition celebrated the diverse prints within our garment collection. Having lots of loose garments and examples of prints on display was a new approach for the in-house archive team and it resulted in a more visually exciting result for our visitors. We also included new interactive activities like colouring sheets made from our garment prints. We're also going to give you a sneak peek of this exhibition in the following film. Keep your eye out for the 1940s apron on the right.
Moving on to a quite different project, this exhibition was all about marking 100 years of the Royal Air Force. Back in 2018, we worked with MNS charity partners to mark 100 years of the RAF and to explore the links between MNS and the Royal Air Force. MNS and the RAF perhaps isn't an obvious connection, but MNS Chairman Simon Marks actually helped to found the RAF Air Cadets in 1938, and over 320 MNS employees went on to serve in the Royal Air Force during World War II. To prepare for this exhibition, we worked with a PhD student from the University of Leeds to explore previously untapped parts of the collection and to build a fuller picture of the MNS colleagues who served during the war. We worked with other parts of MNS on this project as MNS was a corporate sponsor of the RAF centenary. We raised money for RAF 100 charities and the exhibition was actually opened by our CEO Steve Rowe along with the Assistant Chief of the Air Staff, Air Vice Marshal Mike Wigston. I'm going to show you a brief film from the opening of the exhibition. I'm here at the Leeds Archive today as we launch our new exhibition which celebrates a partnership that goes back over 80 years with the RF. And we've coincided that to launch an appeal, the RF 100, which celebrates their centenary. We felt this was a fantastic opportunity to look at part of MS heritage that's a really proud part of our history, but that we don't know very, very well. We didn't know really the details. We've got some letters from the Second World War period showing just how instrumental um, MS's Simon Marks was. The partnership started when Simon Marks was co founder of the Air Force Cadets in 1938, and it's a relationship that's continued ever since, right down to the fact that in 1941, MS colleagues raised £5,000 for a Spitfire which flew over Dunkirk. These items have never been on display before, so it's a really fantastic opportunity for people to come along and see this aspect of MS heritage and our links with the RAF. Every year or two we work on a community project with older people in local care homes or those who use day centres. We work with arts practitioners to help us use objects from the archive collection to spark memories and as a prompt for creative outputs. For this project, we worked with the renowned Leeds International Piano Competition, who secured a grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. We worked with the team from the piano competition, using our collection of early 20th century sheet music with a group of older people in the community. We held events at the archive and in local care homes, and we hosted an exhibition in our temporary exhibition space called Stories from the MS Sheet Music. And I'm going to show you a film introducing the exhibition and the project. Sheet music was a bestseller at Max and Spencer in the early 20th century, and we have a huge collection of it here at the archive now. We're working with Leeds International Piano Competition to help a group of people with dementia to explore this collection of sheet music. Over eight weeks, the group will listen to recordings of the piano music, and then with the help of writer Sarah Perry, they'll curate a recital, and they'll put together some programme notes to help others to interpret the music as well. Every session, we look at some objects from the archive and we listen to some sheet music, and then we do a creative activity. And that activity can be anything, you know, we've done painting, we've done letter writing, um, we've written a story together as a group. But ultimately, what we're aiming to do is explore a theme. So each week's had a theme, sometimes romance, dancing, celebration, food, family, all of these different things. The idea is that the participants have space to tell us about themselves, to remember things, to tell us their take on that theme, what, what it means to them, um, or to use their imagination. What's been fantastic when we've listened to the music in the sessions is to see the different responses from people, and we know from the way that people are interacting how much they're enjoying the opportunity to explore something new and hear some new music. Nice, jolly bright music, loud music, it lifts you, it lifts you, the mood is absolutely amazing. We sing along, gets everybody's feet tapping, and it carries on when we get back to our centre. 
as well as the weekly sessions, we're putting together a set of specially curated performances that will go into care homes around Leeds. So all the work that the group have done will get put together in programme notes. These will be added to an online resource which can be used by any community group or care home to run similar sessions themselves. It's making our job easier, it works, it gets everybody chatting, everybody. We really believe in the power of music and we think that music should be inspiring and interesting for all audiences that come across it and it's a chance for people to carry on learning new things, carry on meeting new people, carry on having a really creative outcome and activity within their lives. As well as that, there'll be an exhibition that's open to the public right here at MS. There'll be a piano that you can come and play on. You can check out the sheet music yourself and you can listen to some of the recordings too. The project will culminate in a temporary exhibition here at the MS archive. So all the participants will have the chance to see their work on display, which is always a really great thing to do. The other great thing you'll be able to see during that exhibition is the creative responses from this group that have worked with us on a weekly basis. So you can read the poems they put together, the stories they've written together, uh, and definitely some great art work as well. We also work with other external partners like student groups from local universities where we set a brief and open up the archive collection for them to explore and interpret. For this exhibition we worked with academics at the University of York in 2019. Our archive contains thousands of food related objects from packaging and adverts to technical documents. These objects can all spark memories and inspire conversations about how we shop, what we eat and our food habits. This temporary exhibition celebrated two projects that look at the role that food plays in older people's lives. The left hand side of the exhibition called My Life of Food was curated by the University of York team, while the right hand side focused on our Sparking Food Memories project. As part of a University of York research project, a group of older people documented their everyday food practices. The photographs they took show their relationship with food from shopping to family meal times, and the exhibition explored how the participants' habits might have changed in light of their changing life circumstances. At the same time, we worked with residents from Simon Marks Court Care Home to discover food related objects in the archive and they worked with two artists to create an artwork inspired by what they found. Each week the group learnt a different creative process from printing through to needlework and the outcome was this tactile tablecloth which will be used by the care home during activity sessions in the future. The last thing I want to show you is perhaps the most ambitious exhibition that we've put on to date, our Kids Takeover. We worked with eight groups of children to take over our entire exhibition, working digitally with groups across the country, including schools and home educator groups. I'm Caroline and I work here at the m &S Company Archive in Leeds and this is the Kids Takeover. We're so excited. The first time in our history we've opened our doors to young people. We've let them recurate our displays and tell the MS story in their own words. I was lucky enough last month to go into Holy Name School to see the children in their classroom working on the project and to find out more about how they were enjoying the whole process. There you are. Come on, follow me. Okay, this morning we are going to be looking at the different artefacts from the 50s and 60s. So what story could this artefact tell? They've all like said that they wanted to play something together. Brilliant, love it. Do you think you'd have liked to have lived in the 1950s? I'd quite like to have gone through all those like bigger changes. <laughs> now we have like zips and then there's like mm -hmm. buttons on everything. Yeah, there's no Velcro, is there? No. 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 <laughs> Why do you think it's an everyday dress? What tells us that? The children have used so many skills throughout this project, including analytical skills, historical inquiry, loads of creative work and design, and they've really been able to look at what they've made and evaluate it. Is that you? Yeah. That's super cool. Being able to communicate with MS digitally through Padlet has allowed us to upload our ideas, as well as sources being sent to us, so it's bringing the archive to the school. Three, two,
When I saw her, I felt like really proud that that was our work, that we'd made that. The children have been involved in the project from beginning to end. So from selecting the items, writing the labels, the creative work, the research, they've told the story of M&S in their own words and presented it beautifully for us. I was really happy to learn about the history of Marks and Spencers. It's been really refreshing to have a different voice coming through in the exhibition interpretation. It adds a different dimension and brings it to life. I'll probably rem remember how excited I was and how many people I told. I think it's turned out better than I could have imagined it would have done. It's been a great success. We've had such a creative response from the children and they've reinterpreted the collection in a way that we could never have imagined. We're thrilled to bits. Yay! I wanted to end with a roundup of some of the new additions we've made to our permanent exhibition over the last few years. Our oral history post allows visitors to listen to the experiences of colleagues from all over the business. This gives visitors an insight into what it's like to work at M&S and of course some behind the scenes gossip about the process of developing new M&S innovations over the years. We've also continued to work on improving accessibility in the exhibition. We know how popular our guided tours of the exhibition are. They add so much more interpretation than we can express in our exhibition captions. So we decided to develop an audio guide so that individual visitors could also access the guided tour experience. And we launched our audio guides last year. We've also developed a large print exhibition guide to share this additional interpretation for those with hearing loss. And it's also suitable for visitors with a visual impairment that makes our captions hard to read. We also use and offer sunflower lanyards, which is a scheme for those with hidden disabilities. Wearing the hidden disabilities sunflower discreetly indicates that someone might need additional support, help or a little bit more time. We've also added new interactive screens, which we can use to share games and jigsaws based on content from the archive, as well as vintage cinema adverts and additional interactive content linking into our temporary exhibitions. We hope to add to what's possible with these in future. Of course, the archive exhibition developed not just to reflect changes at M&S, but it also reflects our continuing research into M&S heritage. For example, recent work has helped to identify images that better reflect M&S diversity from the 1960s onwards, and some of these images now feature in the exhibition. I hope you've enjoyed some sneak peeks into our exhibitions and how we work behind the scenes. Please pop any questions in the comments section below, or if you're watching this later, do email us at company.archive at marksandspencer.com. For anybody interested in the community reminiscence projects I've mentioned, there's a link here to our online reminiscence resources, which include lots of image packs and activities, as well as a set of specific resources from our piano sheet music project. These are free for anyone to use, either individually or in groups or care homes. We hope to see some of you in person at the archive in future. Thank you very much and bye for now.